heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. Hello, welcome again to Louis Sinclair Investigates the Doddleston Mysteries, where we'll find out more about an unstable experiment being run by a mysterious entity, possibly an enhanced AI humanoid from the future, or something paranormal, or an extraterrestrial, an experiment that challenges our understanding of time. 4th of August 1985 Debbie told Lucas that she was going to visit Brazenose College and talk with Robin Peedle, the librarian herself. And within moments he replied, Maid, please do not go. What was his concern? His reply was very strange. Little power. And then silence. Was there some kind of energy being used to make their connection? An energy that could vary in strength, possibly... An instability in time, a, a disruption. A couple of weeks later, Debbie asked Lucas if he knew why poltergeist activity had started again at Meadow Cottage after a break of nearly six weeks. Strangely, he replied that he was suffering exactly the same thing in his own house. He added, My advice to you is that we speak privately, for example, when our undesirable friends are not in our company. Debbie had a bright idea. She put a piece of paper and a stick of charcoal on top of the monitor. Perhaps, rather like with the chalk marks, he could communicate with them unseen like that. Next day, as they'd hoped, they found a handwritten message saying, Brother Ken, I am much delighted that we be by ourselves without 2109. In your book put Tom. You will have knowledge of my name. It's also the home place of Peter. Peter lived in the nearby village of Harden, his home place. So Tom, or Thomas, Harden, the name that the librarian had suggested, the dean of Brazenose College in 1530, and charged, as a staunch Catholic, with refusing King Henry VIII's decree requiring the clergy to cross out the Pope's name from the chapel prayer books, which is why he fled to Doddleston and changed his name to Lucas. He asked them, however, to continue calling him Lucas to protect his identity. So we'll do the same. But had they forgotten 2109's warning that knowledge of Lucas's true name could bring disaster? The following week, Lucas asked for more information about their time to include in his book, a book that he'd hide in the college in the hope that in safer times it would be found. These books... Lucas's and Ken's are actually really significant, and we'll think about them closely in our conclusions. 3rd of September, 1985. Early morning. Bleary from a night of loud footsteps on the roof, Ken walked into the kitchen and, to his surprise and horror, saw that the beeb was missing. Poltergeists? Lucas? 2109? Or burglars? This was getting beyond a joke. Blanking his mind to the shock, he went to the bathroom, and there, the computer equipment, and luckily not damaged. A couple of days later, Ken and Debbie were woken by a crash of falling metal. The computer had been moved to the end of the kitchen table, and this time, the disk drive lay broken on the floor. 2109, perhaps? Trying to stop them communicating with Lucas to avoid disrupting the experiment? or indications that indeed by finding out Lucas's real name, the disaster that 2109 had warned them about had actually started, and written on a kitchen surface a chalk message. One more chance. Quickly they moved the bee back to its original location, and, as discreetly as possible, left a pencil and a sheet of paper where the computer had been, possibly some kind of sensitive location. And by evening, Lucas had left them a handwritten message. 
a message that added yet another character to this story. Lucas said that he'd been visited by a, a very arrogant man called One, who glowed green and was a time traveller. One had said to Lucas that he'd brought misfortune upon himself by his involvement with the computer, warned him that 2109 was out of control, and that he was very worried that all of them were putting themselves in danger if they continued with their communications. Now with 2109 and One, they appear to be dealing with two unworldly entities, mutually antagonistic entities, it seemed. But which of them should they trust? 2109, who seemed rather odd and moody, or one who apparently had expressed genuine concern about their involvement with 2109? The following week, after the science teacher had fixed the disk drive, Ken fired up the beep, and this appeared on the screen. Silence before the storm. A warning? Ken wrote back, asking 2109 why it was preventing them from contacting Lucas and what it made of the poltergeist activity. Half an hour later came the reply. You refer to the forces that you yourself have unleashed against our better judgment. It is correct for you to assume that the poltergeist phenomena is present in the communications. Later adding that the force, referring to one, is usually an extremely foul entity which seems to thrive on strong, adverse emotions, making little sense in its communication. It seems to play on an individual's fear. So now, a reversal. Previously, one had warned them about 2109, and now 2109 was expressing concern about their involvement with one. And, in addition, the collective said that by Ken, Debbie and Peter, having communicated with one, they'd unleashed a disastrously negative force before some kind of storm. 2109 finished by explaining that it had closed down its connection with Lucas to let things cool down. So yes, 2109 was in control. 15th of September. A message from 2109, but one with a slight edge to it. We have reason to believe that you have Lucas Wingman's true name. If this is correct, you must say so, so we may rectify the problem immediately. You may now continue to write to Lucas to establish your responsibility to our experiments. Another reference to experiments. Were Ken, Debbie and Peter part of some unworldly research? Just specimens to be manipulated to see what would happen? Ken replied that, yes, they did know Lucas's real name. 2109 freaked out, saying it had modified Lucas's messages for their benefit, that they were messing with things beyond their comprehension. And, if they continued, this could lead to devastating consequences. So, 2109 was altering the messages. And finally, with a, a note of hostility, 2109 demanded to know who one was. Ignoring that, Ken merely insisted that 2109 stop the poltergeist activity, if that's what it was. 2109 replied that it would try to do so. And in return, they were to ask Dave from SPR what he thought about tachyons and theories of time. Tachyons? Where was this going? Here's a tachyon field with its hypothetical vector particles, tachyons, that always travel faster than light. It's theorised that if ordinary matter, shown here in blue, could be forced to interact with tachyons, then after initially being scattered or contained due to electromagnetic effects, space-time would be affected, as in black holes, and the ordinary matter would be absorbed and swept along faster than light, thus potentially opening a door to time travel. Far-fetched? Not necessarily. Particles within black holes almost certainly travel faster than light. And, of course, the famous Higgs field was also purely theoretical until the Higgs boson was discovered at CERN in 2012. So was this 2109's experiment? Lucas, Ken, Debbie and Peter in some kind of cosmic petri dish? Seeing if the collective could harness tachyons to connect different times and possibly change the past? And is that why one had such animosity towards 2109? Was 2109 messing around with something that could destabilise reality, 
After all, 2109 had admitted, We are not entirely in command of this experiment. 2109 offered Ken a deal. Ken would explain who Juan was, and in return, the SPR researchers would get straight answers to their questions. Then, perhaps as a peace offering, 2109 answered some questions that Peter had asked. First, if someone were to physically travel through time, they must take the place of a person of that time to keep the scales of reality balanced. And second, Lucas was indeed from the 16th century, but he was not what he seemed to be. And now the collective, 2109, demanded its side of the bargain. They were to persuade Lucas to contact Juan that night, as 2109 wanted to speak with him immediately. 21st of September. At last Dave Welch from SPR turned up. He was fascinated by all the talk of tachyons and the addition of yet another mysterious entity, Juan. The main part of SPR's investigation was going to start. Everyone was to leave the cottage except Dave. He would put ten questions to 2109 and, after 45 minutes, delete the message. The others would return, he'd leave, and if answers came through, they were to read them to him over the phone. If the answers fitted the questions, then SPR would know that Ken and the others were not hoaxing. But that, as Dave was beginning to suspect, something was going on, either something paranormal or a modern-day hoaxer sending messages as data down the earth wire of the Beeb's electricity supply. A couple of days later, Ken asked Lucas if he knew anything about one. Lucas replied that one had talked nonsense and was constantly boasting about his amazing powers. But rather amusingly, he said, I can't take seriously such talk from a man who is green. Moments after Lucas had said farewell, 2109 replied with the answers that Dave had asked. Ken rang Dave and reported back. Dave said that, though the questions had not been fully answered, much of the message did relate to them. Ken and Debbie were so relieved, they were off the hook. Well, at least that's what they thought. 30th of September. Dave and John from SPR arrived at the cottage again, and, as a final test, they asked 2109 to give them the date of the next supernova and its location. And after 2109 had given the answer, Dave spotted what he thought was a critical error. He said that the Delphinus constellation that 2109 had mentioned was to the north of the celestial equator, not to the south, as 2109 had said. Dave pointed this out to 2109 and said that he'd changed his mind and that, in his professional opinion, the whole thing was actually just a cheap hoax. After Dave and John had left, this came through from a rather irritated 2109. Hmm. Cheap hoax, eh? Something tells us that they haven't been doing their homework. Tut, tut! Came the sarcastic reply. You see, the Delphinus constellation is to the north when looking at it from Earth, but apparently from beyond the Milky Way it appears to the south. No wonder that 2109 had responded sarcastically, so typically humanocentric. In the message, 2109 had also warned them not to give any of Lucas's messages to SPR. They were not to be trusted. And furthermore, the entity one was nothing more than an aberration. Whatever that meant. 20th of October, 1985. After nearly a month of largely agreeable messages from 2109, something came through that felt rather different. I know your greatest fears. I can interfere with all signal transmitting devices, including computers. I have the power to make you do exactly what is required. This shines a, a very different leam on the story. To, to what extent can we trust Lucas's messages if 2109 could interfere with his computer's transmissions? The collective had said that it was modifying them. Was it influencing or changing the messages to suit the experiment, perhaps? Or was there another, rather obscure reason? A couple of days later, John Bucknell arrived with a new SPR colleague, Nick Sowerby Johnson. Apparently a, a rather aggressive man, who didn't so much ask them questions as interrogate them. After they'd left, 2109 complained that Nick's bad vibes had caused serious problems with its ability to communicate. 
The collective feared that Nick's probing could disrupt the entire experiment. Whatever that was, thought Ken. 27th of October. This strange interchange appeared on Ken's borrowed beeb. SM fields will cause more than disruption with this kind. No more games, tell them. Why don't you? You know why. Two things. It seems they'd overheard an argument, possibly between 2109 and 1. And SM fields, secondary magnetic fields, presumably. And if so, what was the relevance of magnetism? A couple of days later, Lucas wrote saying that 2109 wanted him to write to the 1980s folk on paper to ensure that others, presumably one, couldn't read their communications. 2109 followed this up with this short message. Sorry to communicate this way, but we're trying to sort things out. Continue with experiment. We'll do our best. 2109. There was obviously strife in the future over the experiment, perhaps. Uh, the experiment possibly in time manipulation. On paper, Lucas said that some of his earlier messages were either not from him or had been altered, as they suspected. Meanwhile, 2109 was writing on the Beeb again. The collective certainly didn't like Nick Sowerby Johnson. Your friend Nick is a crashing bore. Where does he work? MI5? USSR? Can't find him anywhere. Maybe he's won. No more games with SPR. We've had enough. Just let them annoy us one more time. They'll so know this isn't a hoax. 2109 was evidently becoming deeply agitated. It couldn't find Nick because, as it later explained, one was blocking some of its powers. And to rub it in, one sent this mocking taunt to 2109. 2109? Poor, poor Jack in the Box. What will he do without a spring? Now he'll never be able to perform for the children. Oh, and how the children will cry. The children, presumably Ken, Deb and the others, that 2109 was trying to impress, according to one. And with that, one, whom they decided was a troublemaker and had burst into 2109's connection with them, was never heard of again perhaps because 2109 had got round to having a word with him, warning him off, or indeed pushing him, possibly the unleashed force, out of the connection. A few days before Christmas, they found out what SPR had made of the Doddleston mystery, but in a very unsatisfactory and rather insulting way. Their local newspaper, the Chester Observer, had published a front-page article about the so-called Doddleston Mysteries following an interview with Dave Welch and John Bucknell about the Society for Psychical Research's conclusions. First, they said that the ten-question test had resulted in answers that were nothing more than waffle, despite what SPR had originally said about the questions having been partially answered. Second, SPR was convinced that human agencies were involved in a hoax and there was nothing paranormal going on. So, for some reason, SPR had backed off. Apparently, no report was ever filed, and the main researchers, Dave Welch and John Bucknell, handed in their resignations shortly afterwards. And curiously, very curiously, SPR said that they'd never heard of anyone called Nick Sowerby Johnson. 17th of January, 1986, Peter made a rather surprising suggestion. He'd been reading up about the paranormal and thought that Ken and Debbie's ability to write in medieval English was due to some kind of external telepathic influences. As they were mulling this over, a surprising message came through from 2109. There is a brilliant ufologist. His name is Gary M. Rowe. His ideas differ somewhat to yours, but nevertheless, he can help you with a couple of your problems. And actually gave them Gary's telephone number. The phone call went well. Gary wasn't at all dismissive. Rather, he was enthusiastic about the possibility of UFO or extraterrestrial activity. He said he'd visit them soon. Next day, Ken decided to ask 2109 about UFOs, and a most interesting reply came through shortly afterwards. Time, UFOs and most other types of the paranormal are in some way all connected. In certain geographical locations, there is what we call areas of convexual magnetism. Imagine, if you will, 
circles running around the Earth clockwise, positive lines of magnetic force, and also circles running anti-clockwise, counterclockwise around the Earth, negative. When two opposite running lines are crossed, the light-time continuum is vastly distorted, so much so that a sensitive individual may witness a timescape, that is, a glimpse of a past event or that of a future event. 2109 continued, explaining what happens when someone or something travels through time. Imagine again, please, a person from the future happily floating along in their silver spaceship, crossing an area of convexual magnetism. All of a sudden, they may feel slightly dizzy or nauseous. A green mist forms around the vessel. They then will probably fall into a trance state of such depths that their soul is squeezed through the light or time gate and forced to project a physical mirror image of them as a being of their place and time. Onlookers from the time which is broken into will witness the physical sight and actions of this alien from another time. Was this what 2109 had been referring to? Was Nick Sowerby Johnson actually nothing more than a projection of one? as 2109 had suggested, trying to ruin the experiment with his bad vibes. 27th of January. Lucas had become confused and worried. Was he actually risking his soul with all these strange communications? In response, Peter quoted some reassuring thoughts from St. Paul's Acts of the Apostles. Lucas replied, Please tell me, good brother, who is St. Paul? At this, Peter completely lost it. How could anyone from that highly religious time not know who St. Paul was, particularly a priest? In anger, he said they'd been completely wasting their time. The whole thing was obviously a hoax, and he wanted nothing more to do with it, and stormed out. <coughs> Following Peter's outburst, Ken and Debbie found themselves arguing bitterly. As had happened many times before, the mood in the cottage was dreadful. 1st of February, 1986. Lucas called for a pen and paper. He wrote, I said, what of St. Paul? What of those words you used for your counselling of me? It had been nothing more than a misunderstanding. Of course he knew who St. Paul was. He was just puzzled about the relevance of the quotation. And presumably he'd overheard Peter's outburst. But despite this, the mood settled somewhat. Following a quick visit to Meadow Cottage two weeks later, Gary Rowe, the ufologist, managed to establish a private connection to 2109 and, like SPR, was never heard from again. 15th of March 1986. Lucas said that his days in Doddleston were coming to an end. Grosvenor wanted him out. Was there anything else they wanted to ask him? In a warm, caring message, Ken asked for more information about the leams, the lights, the computer. Lucas explained, I saw a green light issuing from the walls of my chimney, and from this light stepped what I thought was the devil himself. I did never fear for my soul so much in my life, but so afraid was I that I could not move away from this strange messenger. He said, Fear not, good Thomas. Then he did disappear leaving the leams, which seems to me to be identical to your computer. 21st of March. Lucas's final message came through. My faithful fellows and sweet maid, Grosvenor has said, now Thomas must go. I know this to be best, for the people of Doddleston are fearful of my home. Grosvenor said that they will burn my old farm down. One day you will all sit at my table for wine and food by the river in Oxford, where we shall read each other's books and laugh. My love to you all. Thomas Harden. And later, 2109's last message too. Ken, Deb, Peter, true are the nightmares of those that fear. What you fear will be your reality if you let it. Believe in yourselves. As long as your kind cannot penetrate our world, we are safe. Turn, pretty flower, turn towards the sun, for you shall grow and sow. But the flower reaches too high and withers in the burning light. 
Knowledge will be your progress, but your kind are coming close to getting their fingers burnt. Indirectly, you may prevent this. And that led to 2109 explaining why the Collective had involved Ken, Debbie and Peter in the experiment. Having experienced it, they were the only ones who were qualified to warn humanity of future potential disasters, warning humanity about getting their fingers burnt. 2109 finished by instructing them to Get out your bricks. Get ready to build. Write the book. Thomas did eventually write his book and soon died shortly after. He placed it in a secure place. It shouldn't take too many years to find it. We will finish now. There is no need for you to write back as we will have gone. Thank you for your cooperation. 2109. And that was the end. Luckily, Ken did write his book. But what of Lucas's? I wonder, is it still under oaken floorboards, perhaps deep in dust and hidden for half a millennium? I think it's time now to do our detective work, examining the clues from the story, some obvious, some obscure, put the pieces of that puzzle together, see if we can form a clear picture and figure out what was really going on. There'll be one or two surprises, to say the least. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you after the break for part four, the messages and those hidden but very revealing clues. And if you could do the like, subscribe and share things, I'd be most grateful. So until next time, thank you for watching. Cheerio. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy.